Hello and welcome tonight. Um, I'm so excited to welcome you to this virtual conversation about Julian Zelizer's new book, Burning Down the House, Newt Gingrich, The Fall of a Speaker and the Rise of the Republican Party. I'm Alexis Coe, author of You Never Forget Your First, a biography of George Washington. And this evening I have the pleasure of moderating a discussion um, and this is repeated twice in my notes, but um, as I said, Julian is here tonight. He is a professor of history and public affairs at Princeton and a CNN political analyst. He's also the author of Fault Lines, A History of the United States Since 1974, which he co-authored with Kevin Cruz, and The Fierce Urgency of Now, Lyndon Johnson, Congress and the Battle of, for the Great Society. Um, and Julian is the author of far more books, which I noticed when I took the cover off of his, and it has his initials. And how does that happen, you wonder? It's when you've literally written. This worked better when I did it before. This many books, a lot of books. So looking forward to that one day. This program is an ongoing series offered by the Brooklyn Historical Society, which has been a cultural hub for civic dialogue and community engagement for over 150 years. And I have to add, as the person introducing me usually does at this moment, that I started my career at BHS. I was an intern when I was in graduate school, and it's always a great honor to be invited back and to feel so supported by BHS. And I hope, and this is my own addition here, they did not ask me to do this, they don't know I'm doing this, um, that you might consider supporting them too. In addition to being closed to visitors for so many months, there was a leak in the reading room and they could really use your support. Um, I get the first go at Julian, but feel free to share your questions. You can type them into the Q&A box. Um, we'll take about four or five of them at the second part of the program, which will last in total for about an hour. And I also want to mention that the book is available for purchase um, via the website bookshop.org. We'll put a link um, to bookshop.org in the chat for your convenience. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the author of the evening, uh, Julian Zelizer. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks for doing this, Alexis. And thanks to the Brooklyn Historical uh, Society. It's such a great great place and so uh, even though we're not all there it's wonderful to be doing an event and uh, I agree throw your support uh, to this important institution and thank you all of us for joining um, from home we would all rather be together in um, the room and when that's possible to do safely we will we will go um, Julian this is an interesting book because I feel like you know, I've read a lot of your work. I haven't read all the books yet. Um, but I, I've i seen a lot of these themes and I feel like I've sort of watched you with Jim Wright for a while. And But I was overwhelmed by the story I got that this time. So explain to me who Jim Wright is, what he has to do with Newt and, um, you know, why he is this central character. So Jim Wright was a, a congressman from Texas. He was a politician who very much identified with the New Deal era and the Great Society era. Um, he was a moderate Democrat on many issues. He had supported the war in Vietnam. Uh, and it's only really in the 1970s when he becomes majority leader in 1976 that he starts to move to the left and as a party leader kind of go where, where the party is. Most important, he becomes Speaker of the House in 1987 after serving as Majority Leader for 10 years. He replaces Tip O'Neill, uh, who was a very well-known and by the end of his career, beloved figure in American politics. And so in 1987, Ronald Reagan is finishing his second term. And here, Jim Wright, this old school politician, very much committed to defending liberalism, uh, a last stand for liberalism against the Reagan revolution takes over. Uh, and he will come into office and be right uh, in the uh, crossfire of Newt Gingrich, who's a young and up and coming Republican who's looking for someone to take down. And here is a very juicy target. And he tried many different ways, right? There were um, ethics violations, allegedly, and then also some that, that did actually occur. Um, 
but what was interesting to me is, you know, I've known these stories from reading about them. I never looked at, at this Washington Post story that was pivotal. And I actually did this last week. It's harrowing. So I don't necessarily suggest it, even though you can find it online. Um, it, uh, it's adjacent to write though, which is really interesting. Um, it has to do with an aide. He is the focus and something that happened um, years prior. Um, so explain that. And, you know, I've already mentioned that it's triggering and, and why, how that possibly affected Wright himself. So, yeah. So, I mean, I'll, I'll give away the story and that the story revolves around Gingrich leading this charge to bring down the Democrats, to retake Congress for the Republicans. And when he attacks Jim Wright, most of his attack is on very small ethical issues that have been reported on in the press. Really nothing very major, but enough to make him look bad and enough to whip Washington up into a pretty big frenzy. Uh, and Gingrich would call him the most corrupt speaker uh, in American history. And, and the House Ethics Committee, we can talk later, has an investigation. But right at the very end, as this investigation is happening, as journalists are reporting on what Gingrich is doing, uh, a story appears in the Washington Post, which is not connected uh, to Newt Gingrich's campaign. And it's about one of the top aides uh, for Jim Wright, someone who had worked with him for many years, a guy named John Mack. And in the Washington Post style section, a huge story, it's, if you could see it physically, it's almost worth it, uh, appears about John Mack, who was well known in Washington. He was beloved by a lot of Democrats. But when he was younger, when he was a younger man, he viciously attacked a woman when he was working in a stock room without any apparent cause, didn't even know her, uh, and brutally beat her, almost killed her. Uh, and, and this story had always been around in Washington, but people kind of said, well, he served some time and he was rehabilitated. Now he's a good person. But all of a sudden, the story appears, and it appears in vivid detail. Uh, the writer, Ken Ringel, is a practitioner of the new journalism trying to write in a literary style. And this appears in many Democrats who didn't think Jim Wright deserved to leave office and thought this was all a, a cooked up scandal. They got scared after this. And, and many legislators were like, this is enough to know this person is in Jim Wright's orbit. Uh, but it was an amazing story to discover, frankly. And in part because it was adjacent to the actual story that I was focusing on. It, it is really well written, and it reminds me to say that your book is incredibly well written, and it reads like a thriller. As, uh, you know, from the moment you start with the introduction and you go through, um, and what was, was so interesting to me is that, um, and you already sort of touched on it, but this is when Republicans learned nothing was off limits. This is what we have now gotten quite used to, although it's still quite, you know, it's shocking every time under Trump or the Trump administration. But this was really the first time in which the Republican Party um, decided, and you went into the archives and you saw this, you talk about how explicitly this was stated, that they decided gloves are off, nothing's off limits. This is the, what we know as Trumpism is actually Gingrichism, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So, I was really interested as I wrote the story, and, and it is, it's a political thriller, not because of me. It really was at the time. It's, it's the ultimate drama. The most powerful person in Washington is brought down from power by someone who is seen as this maverick outside the inner circle kind of politician, and it succeeds. And, and, and just for perspective, this was the first speaker who had ever resigned uh, from the House. So it was a big deal for a Republican in a party that had not been in power in the House since 1954 to take down the Speaker, essentially. And part of what I was interested in, how do the Republicans, the party, start to embrace what Gingrich is about? Because at the time, and now it's hard to imagine, uh, because we see this all the time, what he was doing was seen as truly toxic, that Gingrich was uh, trying to do character assassination in ways that reminded many people of Joe McCarthy. And he was taking the basic processes of government, whether it was ethics reforms that were meant to clean up Washington uh, or floor speeches, and just 
launching grenades at, at the Democrats. But my story shows that senior Republicans basically say, okay, we're willing not only to go along with this, but by the end of my story, they elect him to a leadership position because of what he's doing to Jim Wright. Because he's successful, uh, he wins this uh, position called House Minority Whip, which if you're not in Washington, sounds like just some technical term, but it's actually an important leadership role. And it puts you on the path to being a party leader. And again and again, at different moments in my book, whether it was George H.W. Bush, whether it was uh, the House Minority Leader, Bob Michael, what I kept finding was Republicans said, we're not like Gingrich, we're gonna stay away from him, but they keep inviting him into the doors. And, and the story ends, not only with Gingrich as one of the Republican leaders, but with his form of partisanship legitimated because Jim Wright finally falls from power. And not what, that's what I love about the book is it really brings together, um, it tells us this origin story that um, has become obscure, you know, that we just don't talk about a lot. You know, uh, Tip O'Neill, I haven't heard his name in, in years, but I, as a child, I heard his name all the time. It was, it, he, and I read about him when I read about this time period. But this moment is so interesting to me because it's sort of what we heard what was circling around the the GOP in which they said, look, nobody likes the way Trump does this, but he does it and he gets it done. So let's just deal with it for another four years. Um, and that's not the first time that's happened. And what was really interesting to me in the book is when you discuss, it was sort of like my last book was on George Washington and it was like he was reading his farewell address <laughs> and watching his nightmare happen. And in the farewell address, Washington says, you know, what's going to happen is people are only going to care about power. And what they're going to do is policy doesn't matter. The voters don't matter. Um, our personal principles don't matter. Power. Power is the most important thing. And to watch this moment in your book unfold as you said it's like a thriller even though you know what's going to happen it's sort of it's just incredible it's really um what an interesting time to be writing this book and a great time to be reading it yeah and I, what i what i'm drawn to in telling the story this way which is different than a lot of the books that i've written in terms of finding a real uh story a, a, a very clear focused narrative was two things. One is we talk about partisanship all the time. We talk about how toxic Washington's become since the 70s. And usually when this is discussed, and I'm guilty of this, you talk about these huge fat forces that bore down on, on Washington, whether it's how the media changed or how voters yeah. sorted themselves out or how gerrymandering worked. Um, but I wanted to start writing a history of partisanship. And finding the individuals who pushed politics one way as opposed to another, finding real moments, years, specific battles that really mattered in terms of the direction we took. I believe this is one of the most important. Uh, it was always in my head. And, and I wanted to start writing about what happened in Washington in a way that's both digestible, but that actually shows it wasn't inevitable. And, and there are moments when decisions are made because of different leaders when we move to the path that we're in. And, and the second, it, it's a little unrelated, um, but I've spent a lot of my career trying to write about Congress. And I was thinking, we spoke about your book a while ago. Um, it was at the Brennan Center. And we were discussing how you write presidential history and the ways in which you yeah. were thinking of doing it in different ways, in ways that were more accept accessible uh, to a different audience. And I feel that way with Congress. I'm always trying to figure out how do you take this incredibly messy, disjointed, you know, chaotic institution and tell stories about it like you would do a president. It's not as mm -hmm. simple in terms of the chronology. So this story was just really good um, because it has that quality uh, of a gripping narrative, but it's actually getting you in to the story of how did this institution become what it uh, ended up being. And it's rich. It's really rich in this way because there are all these details, you know, that you you can't invent. Like, you know, fiction is is great, but nonfiction is amazing. And um, on that note, I really just want to focus on a fine point here, but I think it would be really meaningful for the audience to hear the language that Gingrich used. 
um, the sort of crass and crude language, which we hear from Trump, he's still the only one using it. Um, and Gingrich was the only one using it then. And so I, I would love to hear just some of the words. Yeah, so I'll look, uh, I have the book right here under my computer, uh, and I want to read one, one part of it. But the words were important. Uh, Gingrich is someone, a, a, a story in the book is how he uses the media and how the cable media and the world of investigative journalism become really his base for uh, launching his attacks. And so he's smart. He understands how to do this. And he's very conscious of the stories you tell about your opponents. And he's very conscious of using words that will literally vilify your opponents. And, and he refuses to be uh, soft. He wants to uh, have a full-throated approach. And, and at the end of this, the book, I have this memo, which is really uh, a memo that says it all, where uh, Gingrich ran this organization called GOPAC. Uh, since 1984, it was a political action committee, which he used to distribute cassettes and videos um, audio cassettes and video cassettes and memos to other Republicans, giving them strategy advice. And there was one that came out in 1990. It's been delivered and distributed many times. It was called Language, a Key Mechanism of Control. And Gingrich wrote it uh, with Frank Luntz, who uh, is a pollster uh, and also kind of a speechwriter who helped craft the contract with America in 1994. And in the memo, was to Republican candidates running in the 1990 midterms. And it says, uh, if you're someone who says, I wish I could speak like Newt, these are the kinds of words you had to repeat all the time. Corruption, traitors, sick, radical, shame, pathetic, steal, and lie whenever you're describing the Democrats. And that was pretty blistering stuff uh, for someone who was in the leadership uh, at the time. Gingrich is willing to uh, openly uh, question the patriotism of Democrats on the floor of the House with the television cameras rolling. He really saw no boundaries to the rhetoric that he's going to use. So when I hear Trump and I see the Twitter feed and all of that, it really, for me, is totally rooted in fulfilling the argument that Newt Gingrich was making about what Republicans should be doing. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's just amazing. Um, and you mentioned the media, and the media does play a big role in the book and also in, in Gingrich's rise. He, like Trump, knew how to entertain. He knew how to, um, and also, as you said, this was sort of the, the rise of literary journalism. Um, there was a focus on the stories and how the stories were told um, and, 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 you know, working the media politics and, and politicians have been working on that for a long time and they're just starting to get good at it. Um, but can you sort of give us an idea of, there's no Fox yet, but, but there's C-SPAN. C-SPAN is, you know, relatively new. How does Gingrich navigate these spaces so masterfully and so much better than anyone who came before him? Yeah, I, I mean, his instinct and his understanding of the dynamic is really pretty superb. And and that's not a normative statement in terms of what he did, but in terms of the politics of it, he's constantly outflanking everyone. Yeah. Uh, and the Democrats, Jim Wright doesn't really know how this works or what's coming. So one example in the book is the story of Cam Scam, which is in 1984, uh, Gingrich, and he has a group of uh, allies in something called the Conservative Opportunity Society. It's a small group, uh, ranges between 10 and 20 people. Every day at the end of the day, they go on the floor of the house and they make these one minute speeches, which any member can make. You just stand up and you talk about anything. Uh, and usually those speeches are reserved for insignificant things, naming a post office in your district or nothing very grand or national. Um, but they said, hey, uh, in 1978, the house allowed television cameras to cover the floor. And then in 1979, this cable TV station started covering it every day. So Gingrich says, let's go on the floor. And every day at the end of the day, they make these really pretty vicious speeches about Democrats. That this is a party that doesn't care about the security of this country. They're willing to let communists one, run wild. Uh, they're not going to support Reagan. And the speeches get worse and worse as it progresses. And 
Uh, it finally reaches a point where Gingrich and his allies are naming specific Democrats and saying, you're uh, not someone who cares about our national security, respond. And uh, if you're watching on C-SPAN, you see absolutely nothing, you hear nothing, and it looks like the Democrat has no response. But the truth was the chamber was 100% empty uh, because uh, it was the end of the day and the camera was only allowed to be on the speaker. So it was perfect theater that he understood. And it gets, it escalates into this whole conflict where the speaker, Tip O'Neill, takes him on, pans the chamber to show the public that there's no one there, that this is a ruse. But the whole thing ends, and this is how Gingrich remembers it ending accurately, with the three networks, ABC, CBS, and NBC, so enticed by this controversy on C-SPAN, a channel most people never heard of, and uh, that they cover it. They, they called it Can Scam, and it was on the news on every channel, it was in the major newspapers, and Gingrich said that's really, he talks about, that's what I wanted. I wanted to get in the news, I wanted to become a national figure. And he said, you have to give them confrontation because that's how the news was working. You have to give them conflict. He said, you have to give them more Indiana Jones than Philharmonic. Uh, and that's how it unfolded. And that's just one example of many where uh, it wasn't a conservative media. It wasn't Fox News, Breitbart. It was the mainstream media that he really understood and used well. And, and I can talk about it. It was also investigative journalism, uh, which is another... I, could, I mean, he, he um, weaponizes them. He says after Watergate and Vietnam, you have this whole generation of journalists who are doing good work and they're trying to figure out bits and pieces of how government works and are there shady deals and uh, where's the money kind of questions. But what he does is, is he looks at stories about someone like Jim Wright and he picks bits and pieces of them uh, and he puts them together back to the rhetoric in a very clear cut argument about who the person is. And he's using the articles as support, even though he's often just taking initial stories and really uh, still kind of undercooked arguments and he blows them up in great ways. And he has the foundation of legitimate journalism behind him. And it was, I saw this all the time doing the research where journalists really don't see how their work is gonna be used by him. Yeah, um, I think th there's so much there. I think that's like overwhelming because it's so familiar and, and you see it happening here as well. Um, it's taken four years, but news organizations are starting to cut away from Trump when um, he's clearly just using the Rose Garden for a, a, a campaign rally. Um, and so it really is amazing to see those lessons being learned and also not. Um, we've talked about the, the rise of, of him a little bit. And we've talked about the similarities between Trump, you know, it, the, his rhetoric, we talked about the words, but also just the principles. We're talking about nativism. You know, it's a, it's a populist campaign, as you said. Um, this is meant to sort of like, I mean, it does sort of destabilize the political system. And that system was, of course, it's still politics, it's still Washington, but, um, and it wasn't as if everyone was the best of friends, but bipartisanship was a goal. Bipartisanship was something that was understood um, to be a necessity. And, um, that really disappeared at this time in, in an aggressive manner. Um, the Democrats had been in power to, to most people. To, I grew up thinking that that was sort of how it went until um, this happened, you know, as a child before me. And Julian knows the story, but I, um, as a child, didn't tell my parents and took out contract with America when I was 10 years old. And I was very confused for a while about my politics. Um, but this was really masterful in that way where the confusion was, was rampant and, and really he had everyone sort of running around um, in the same way that Trump did mm -hmm. and, um, and still does to a certain extent. And, um, and then there was a moment in which they might end up on the ticket together. Yes. So uh, the, the Donald Trump, Newt Gingrich relation, uh, I mean, <laughs> it shapes the whole book, even though I, I didn't write this book at all with Trump in mind. Most of it was done before Trump 
won the presidency or was running for president. I was, I was really, if there was anything contemporary I was thinking of, it was the Tea Party and everything I was yeah. seeing, what they were doing and how far they were pushing the envelope when President Obama was in office. And I was curious, how did this really uh, come to be? But, but obviously, a lot of what you see in this book, it's hard not to um, understand that this is the world in which President Trump operates very comfortably and, and thrives on. But he was also uh, considered in the final rounds for vice president. I start the book. That's the one time Trump really makes uh, an appearance. There, well, there's two others, but that's the big one. And it's him, Mike Pence, and um, Chris Christie. And, uh, and, uh, and he goes Gingrich to, Gingrich, by the way, had run for president in 2012. And incidentally, Kellyanne Conway was his uh, advisor. So that it's another, wow. yeah, yeah, it's a remarkable threat. And what the story said was that she had trouble and a lot of the advisors had trouble taming Gingrich, keeping him mm. on focus, which is interesting that they were able to do it sufficiently with uh, President Trump. But anyway, he's one of the final picks. He's in Indianapolis. He has an interview, Gingrich, with the Trump team, with the family, with Paul Manafort, uh, with all the advisors who are going to make the decision. And they were impressed with him. They, I think they liked Gingrich um, from what I could see. And then Gingrich goes on TV after his interview. It's a classic Gingrich moment where he goes on Fox from a, a local studio uh, and he's interviewing Sean, he's being interviewed by Sean Hannity who likes Gingrich a lot. Uh, and in some ways wants him to be the pick. And he starts explaining, like if I had written a little talk to set up the introduction, it was perfect because he's explaining the similarities between himself and President Trump, how they're outsiders, how they do what they think, they take on the establishment. And he says they're both pirates. Uh, and he says, and this is the Gingrich part where he almost says something he shouldn't about himself. It might be that two pirates on one ticket, it's just too much. Um, but it was a really interesting moment where their two worlds came so close. It's hard to imagine both of them on a ticket or President Trump, Donald Trump, accepting someone as high voltage as Gingrich next to him. So Pence in the end got it. But it's, uh, I wanted to start the book there by just showing how these two worlds really have to be understood together. I sort of got lost in... Um historians hate hypotheticals, but I sort of got lost in the hypothetical for a moment. What would have happened? How long would, who would have come out walking? <laughs> like, like, how long could they have been on a ticket together? Would they even have made it to the presidency? It's really something to consider. I don't know. I mean, it might have, it might have hurt Trump. I mean, in the end, it might have made the, the campaign, which was already a lot for many people, that much more uh just so in your face and yeah area that somehow it might have undercut it they might have fought more pence is a very go-along person which works well if trump is at the top of the ticket so i could imagine all kinds of problems on the other hand uh, and gingrich mobilizes democrats like few other people he is really one of the most hated figures in American politics and, and because of everything he did as speaker and before. So it could have mobilized some of the Democrats who even Trump couldn't have. Um, but on the other hand, Gingrich is also really respected in Republican circles. And I do think that was the thinking if they had picked him, unlike Mike Pence, he brings a kind of statesman's gravitas uh, within Republican politics. Despite what I'm trying to write, he has this other image that, that might have worked on the ticket. And they are similar in a lot of ways, um, which we've already talked about, their language, their crassness, their outsider views. Um, and they're alike in that they don't have um, what Americans like to believe are moral standards um, for presidents. Um, Gingrich has been married several times. The stories are not great about them. Um, this Pence, he needed Pence. He needed someone the evangelicals could have um, accepted. So what is what was Gingrich's relationship with um, the powerful entities as we now know them, the evangelical community, the Christian community? Very good, despite 
his life is is what you're uh, alluding to is he, he has a very checkered personal history uh, with affairs and broken marriages and none of this secret it's all come out in the press since since the problems with his first wife which came out in a, a story this he married his high school math teacher uh, and they get a divorce and a story comes out in 1984 in a magazine called mother jones about Gingrich. It's one of the first exposés. And it looks like, who is this guy? And what the author uh, ends up writing about is his personal life. And a lot of the article is about not only do many people profoundly dislike him, even those who have worked with him, uh, but he was a known, uh, he, he was known for his many affairs. And there's a story that really caught people's eyes uh, in the article that he talked about uh, their divorce in the hospital while she was there for cancer surgery, uh, which is a story even today, people from that era remember instantly, it, it stuck with him. But there are many stories like that. Uh, during the Clinton impeachment, of course, one of the reasons he's brought down as speaker, he's having an affair once again, as the impeachment of Bill Clinton is taking place, which revolves around an affair. He's been haunted by ethics problems his whole career, uh, even, worse than the ones he accuses other people, but he has been a figure a lot of religious right leaders have supported. Uh, in the 1980s, I found many statements of praise that he was a transformative Republican, because uh, if the first concern is power, and if the concern of a lot of religious right leaders is empowering themselves, he was very attractive despite all of this. They didn't care. So that pragmatism we talk about today uh, was there uh, right off the bat. In no way did he fit the profile of what uh, a religious right activist would apparently want in politics other than one thing. He was promising to bring the Republicans into power in Congress, which he does in 94. And that's the promise I think that they like the most. I see some of the questions coming in. They're similar to some of the ones that I had, which are more about you know, Trump and contemporary connections and such. So I, I want to sort of um, take a step back and jump around a little bit. Um, so obviously, Nude is a good friend of yours. He was very excited about this book. No. Uh, well, I, I don't actually know. So what you're referring to is I wasn't able to interview him despite uh, arranging. I, I don't know how many times I arranged uh, a, an interview with him and only would have very politely his person say it has to be rescheduled. And it, it just never happened. This was over years. I don't know why. And I will say, I always say, I, uh, I'm writing about someone who makes assertions about people. Maybe he was busy. Uh, <laughs> I, I, he was yeah. the one person I wasn't able to interview of all the figures. On the other hand, uh, they did grant me access to his office to his archives. Uh, which are in West Georgia College. And for, for a historian, that ultimately is the bread and butter material you really need to write a good book. And his are, I've told people, the single best collection of contemporary congressional papers I've ever encountered. Uh, unlike most, which are boxes filled with reprints of speeches and articles and letters from constituents, which are interesting, but doesn't get you behind the scenes. His are filled with uh, strategy memos and letters between himself and Republicans, letters between himself and reporters as he's trying to uh, get them to write certain stories. Just unbelievable material, even some handwritten notes at very key moments, including when Speaker Wright is resigning and he's sitting watching, that for a historian, it made my difficulty getting an interview with him really fade. Because uh, this was great. I was able to recreate some of the drama that you're talking about because I saw it firsthand in the documents at the time. And then I had other collections I used, including Jim Wright. And I interviewed uh, almost everyone else, including Wright, which, which gave me a, a little better picture. And I think what you're also saying is that, um, you know, Congress has the right, oddly enough, since they're public servants, and this came about when they were demanding documents from the executive office, but they do have the right to declare certain documents personal, it can be whatever. And that means that the juicy stuff you're referring to, we don't get, and so we do get copy, you know, copies of articles and speeches and things we could very easily find other places, and it's not, 
um, it's not very helpful or, or forthcoming. And so the question is, did he um, grant you access and also make sure that he was collected in such a way because he also sees himself as someone who made a transformation of the, the party and um, his contributions and the way that he did that, he's quite proud of. He's not ashamed of any of this um, or the way that he went about it. You know, that's been clear the whole time. It's just like Trump. But, or is it because, and this is so hard for me to get out of my mouth, but because he's a historian, because right. he has a PhD, um, and, and which one is it? And tell us about that nonsense. I think it's both. I mean, so if you didn't know, Gingrich uh, has a PhD in history from Tulane. Uh, that's what he did after he went to Emory College. And his first job was teaching at West Georgia College, which is where the archives are now located. And, and he barely taught. He, he was there for a very short time. He never published his dissertation. He had very little patience for academia. I write that first year as a professor, he applies to be president of the university, of the college. And Perfect. And he, wants, he has zero patience and he leaves quickly. He, he wants to run and he stops with uh, his research. Um, so I do think part of the answer is that. I do think he, he does have an appreciation for history and sees himself as having a big role in it. Uh, and so my guess is he wanted a first class collection uh, that would allow someone like myself to document what he did and and others. And and the second is, yes, I mean, Gingrich has a grandiose sense of who he is. And I am sure uh, that he wants what he did uh, to be captured, not simply as another member of Congress or even just another member of the Republican Revolution. He wants to be seen as someone uh, who is pivotal. I actually think he is not incorrect. But the good part was it might have helped, um, you know, help him retain more papers than most. I mean, what you're talking about for, for everyone, and this is a historical society, it's an outrage. I mean, members of Congress don't have to keep their papers like we have in the executive branch. And many just don't keep papers. Many destroy them when they leave office. And most of them are housed not in any national archive, but in colleges they went to and different institutions. And so it's, it's very hard to get good material on the history of this institution. So ironically enough, here's a legislator who I argue spends his career really undermining the institution and doing things which make governance incredibly difficult. Yet in terms of the history of Congress, credit should go to him. He shows how to put together a collection so we could understand how this all unfolded. This is not, by the way, well, we, we are saying he understands the importance of collections, you know, for various reasons, legacy building and such, and, and the importance of research. Um, we're not saying that the history is good. Right. <laughs> I am not saying it's good. I shouldn't speak to Julian. But right. he has written about Washington, and he and Calista Flockhart, um, they're donors to Mount Vernon, George Washington's historic home and um, plantation for his forced labor camp. And... Um, they made a god awful documentary about Mount Vernon. It's really terrible, and it just shows them posing in different places on the property. Um, so that's interesting. Um, another thing besides this that I don't like to admit about Gingrich is he was once a child. Um, he indeed was a small human, mm -hmm. and uh, he was even he did something pretty cute. Um, we can. I want to talk about his upbringing and how it shaped him, which I don't think ever really gets discussed. Um, and I was so excited to learn about it and realize that I really didn't know about it. And the story, you know, whether you like him or not, it, you know, it, you cannot deny that it shaped someone. But first I want to say that there was this really charming story. And I think it may be the only one <laughs> and, um, that when Gingrich was a young, precocious uh, boy. So tell us about, tell us about the zoo. Yeah, it's kind of an incredible story. Uh, he was always a, a really, uh, not only ambitious young kid, uh, but also someone who, the, the grandiose sense of self was there right from the start in terms of the, just the drive and determination to do whatever he did. He, he spent a lot of time near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. That's where his family's from. He's not from Georgia. Uh, he eventually moves there. 
Uh, but he spends a lot of his summers there, even after his family has ended up uh, in the South. And there's one story when he's young, he goes and he sees these documentaries um, uh, and he loved animals. He, he always uh, really was into animals and zoos and he doesn't understand why there's no zoo in Harrisburg. And so uh, he, he sees some signs and he goes over to the city offices and meets with high level officials. And basically this kid is in there lobbying them to start a zoo, which they're all taken aback and think this is pretty cute. Uh, but also pretty uh, notable. Uh, and even the publisher of a local newspaper, which basically was like advertisements, he was taken by this guy and he writes a story about it, which is picked up in the AP about a little young boy lobbying for a zoo. And uh, the story stuck at something that appears in, in accounts of him and it gives a good flavor. He wasn't, uh, he was a very serious kid through and through. He I write in the 60s, he didn't really get rock and roll. One of his friends tried to introduce him, listen to the White Album. He really had no idea why anyone cared about that. He's much more interested in politics. But the, the zoo story is, is who he is from the beginning. Yeah, and it's interesting because I'm so happy that there's you know, an administrator who is willing to show him how this works and walk him through it. And I'm also thinking, no, don't teach him anything. Right. Um, but it is a lovely story and he ends up uh, giving a speech before the city council and, you know, but let's talk about just very briefly because we are sort of getting into time now, but um, tell us about his upbringing. It's difficult. Uh, he, he grows up, it, it's a kind of working class family. His father leaves his mother uh, shortly after they get married and she's pregnant. And so he's gone, the dad, by the time he's born. His stepdad, she remarries, and she remarries a, a guy uh, who takes good care of him, uh, is, is responsible, but uh, is very tough, emotionally very tight. Every account of their home is uh, a little bit of fear, saying the wrong thing. Uh, and he was uh, very much uh, into the macho-ness of, of raising, this, raising this boy and what that meant. Uh, and they travel. He's always traveling because his dad's in the military. And so they go throughout Europe. And a lot of his youth before high school is spent seeing different parts of Europe. That affects him a lot. He learns a lot about World War II uh, and, and starts to see a lot of the problems here in the U.S. in, in warlike terms, with grand stakes about everything that's going on. And it's only in high school that he finally settles down. Uh, in Georgia, and that's where his life starts to gain a little bit of stability. So this is a kid who uh, was always an outsider. He was never very rooted. He was not in a family with a lot of love. Uh, and there was a lot of tension between him, his biological father, even his stepfather. And I, I, I'm not a psychology guy, but I think it he always had this anti-authoritarian streak. He's gone after every person who's in charge of him. Uh, and yeah. it's interesting. I think it's connected a little to his upbringing and his outsiderness, I think, is reflected in that. He, he's not a Southerner, but he's not really in, in Pennsylvania anymore. He's always moving around. So when he comes in Washington, it's natural. He still has that exact attitude about uh, everything around him. And I really do think, you know, we aren't psychologists, but I found it so interesting to read. It's, it's very early in the book, obviously, you know, moves chronologically. And um, his mother is assaulted three days after they're married. It's, it, it really does show you how Gingrich was made. Um, and so I'm going to now turn to the really excellent questions. Um, one of them, and I say, and, and I don't just mean because they're similar, but um, the L, there's a question about, and I was curious about this, LBJ in Gingrich. What is their style? How is it similar on the Hill? Um, and I was also thinking it was sort of interesting in terms of the Texas question. Yeah, I mean, very, uh, oh, Gingrich and LBJ, yeah, not, not yeah. LBJ. yeah, I mean, they're uh, very different. So um, I think at, at one level, LBJ was someone who was very committed, even with his immense ego, uh, toward the art of governing. Uh, and, and this, he was a tough partisan LBJ. He was fine uh, going after and trying to curtail his opponents, 
but he believed in the role of government and in the job of governing. And as majority leader of the Senate in the 1950s, uh, he spends a lot of his time rounding up votes for legislation, like the Civil Rights Act of 1957. He spends a lot of time nurturing and working with committees so they would be able to function and serve as voices of the party. He identified with the institution of Congress very closely, and uh, he was a lifetime politician who, who really believed in, in what Washington was supposed to do and what Congress was mm -hmm. supposed to do. Uh, and so even his, his personal life and personal side, which can be very difficult, is well known. But I think that's his identity. He, he was a classic politician, not because he believed in civility or bipartisanship, but like most, he balanced in that era partisanship with governance and with protecting the institutions of democracy. I think that's what most leaders had in their mind. Gingrich didn't care about any of that. When he was in Congress in the 80s before becoming speaker, never wanted to be on committees, couldn't care less about legislation, and really was willing to do everything despite the warnings uh, that would endanger the institutions he was working in. And he didn't identify with them mm. at all. Uh, I think it's very different because you see that as he practiced his politics. It was a destructive form of politics. So, so they're very different. And then there's obviously the grand ideological difference of the era of the New Deal, great society, liberal era of American politics versus Gingrich, who was under the umbrella of the Reagan revolution. Do you think that Gingrich, it, to put it in Republican terms, loves America? The Gingrich, I'll assume he does. I, I assume, I mean, I, I believe he thinks he's fighting for the country. Uh, but I also think he's very clear that what he's doing can be dangerous to the institutions of that country. And I think he's willing to do that. But I just assume, I, yes, uh, he, he does. Whatever that means to him. And Whatever, his, yeah. Sorry. His version of his patriotism. Version of yeah. And I think it's not unusual with someone like Gingrich or Trump that, that what they, their standards for themselves, as far as patriotism, is very different than the people they're calling out. Um, so another question, which is interesting, is um, the Republicans have been weaponizing racism and class resentment since Nixon mm -hmm. um, and really before. Do you think Gingrich represented a quantum step down that road? For sure. I mean, get, so, so the, the use of race by the Republican Party, we, we already see this certainly with uh, Nixon and the Law and Order campaign of 68. You, you see this with other Republicans in the 70s. And, and some, would, some would argue Reagan was already playing around with that kind of politics, even in the 1980 campaign. Uh, Gingrich is very much in, enmeshed in that world. Um, he will quickly disassociate himself from that. He will instantly, when attacked for being part of uh, a white backlash kind of politics, say he supported the Martin Luther King birthday, or he's worked very well with African-American legislation, and race isn't his thing. Yeah. Even if you put that aside, he has been at the center of this new Republican Party that was willing to engage in this kind of politics. And it's not simply he's part of it, he's the guy who, who brings this into the leadership of Congress and legitimates this form of politics. And it's only a step away uh, if you're calling Democrats sick and traitorous to be willing to do Lee Atwater kind of politics, who mm -hmm. also, uh, Lee Atwater appears in my book um, and, and is another interesting connection there. So, so I think it's fair to say he's quite important. Again, he's a power broker. He's about how the Republicans will practice partisanship. That's his contribution. But as he does that, that's part of the world that's forming in the GOP. Right. Um, okay, so then the, let's go with another one. Um, what aboutism is used to negate criticism? Each side references an earlier offender. Is there a Democratic legislature, leg legislature who Newt, Newt could argue set the precedent? Yeah, so that's a very good question. And 
uh, I think it's, it's always a little hard. Uh, it, it, look, there's this basic argument that we have about politics with what about is that, yes, there's partisanship on both sides of uh, the aisle. Uh, I can point to Democrats who clearly were tough, tough partisans and uh, some who went uh, below the belt in their politics, but the parties are different, meaning Republicans, I, I think it's fair to say ideologically, as a whole, move much further to the right starting in this 80s period than Democrats as a whole did moving to the left, meaning Democrats remain much more divided as a party than where Republicans ended up. And many Democratic leaders are still much more to the center, even today, uh, than to the left. Someone like Chuck Schumer is not AOC. And that's a notable uh, fact where mm -hmm. Senator McConnell is very close to where the extreme of, of the Republicans would be. And the second is in terms of strategy. I do think there's a difference. Uh, there are Democrats who have been partisan. There are Democrats who have attacked their opponent. I'm sure Newt Gingrich has a list of them in his pocket that he likes to bring out. Uh, but Democrats as a whole remain committed to government and they remain committed to not ultimately undermining this institution that's at the center of their platform. And so they can't as a whole be so partisan. They're always checked. It's, it's always a recurring story because they don't want to go there because yeah. it would be too dysfunctional. Whereas Gingrich and everyone who followed, they're willing to go there. If government ends up being dysfunctional, if governance is impossible, they've proven their point. So it actually is very different. And I think even now when you might start to see a change because of frustration among Democrats, they're still in a very different place. That's the quote I have from Steve and Bannon who said, yeah. you know, Republicans come, you know, I can't remember the exact word, they come ready, prepared to, they come ready for a head wound and Democrats come for a pillow fight. And I think yeah. there's a difference in the parties. And so while Gingrich might have a list, I don't think it's accurate uh, to compare them. And I think Gingrich's story is about his style of politics, his kind of McCarthyism in the 80s, not just that it existed, it's existed many times, but that he's elected leader. He becomes one of the leaders of the party. That's the transition that's so fascinating and separates the GOP from the Democrats. It's interesting, I, you know, like we're on Twitter, um, as seems to be a professional requirement and is enjoyable at times and also a hellscape at others. Um, and there's, you know, the Lincoln Project, which exists outside of it, but I see it an awful lot, more than I would otherwise. Um, and they're, these are Republicans. These are, um, you know, for the most part, never Trumpers. I'm sure some of them have come over. Uh, George Conway, Kellyanne Conway's husband, is, is a major player in it. And they're so good. Their videos are so good. Their rhetoric is so good. And um, reading your book really solidified why I thought that, which is that, of course, Republicans on Republicans are going to be better than Democrats on Republicans are ever going to be. They're so good. When they hone in, they come together, they stay on message, and they, they just, they, there's no, I don't want to say it's inhumane, but they, they're willing to go there. Yeah, Legending it, is an option. It, it's, it's very uh, clear uh, or notable that the Lincoln Project, that their former Republicans or existing Republicans who've turned on the president. And if you compare them, I wrote an article for USA Today based on this book, and it was about this. And, uh, and I watched some of the, my editor, a uh, very good editor worked with me, Jill Lawrence. And she, you know, she was telling me, look at the Biden um, uh, ads. And she said, they're really not anywhere close to where the Lincoln Project is. And I watched them and it was pretty clear. I mean, the Republicans have something, uh, maybe because of their approach, part of it is now just a history of perfecting this kind of politics that's pretty potent. Uh, and, and you see it already uh, in, in the 80s. I mean, the Democrats in my story don't know how to respond to Gingrich. They, they're constantly behind him every attack he does. Right basically resigns with this dramatic speech where he's warning his colleagues, don't allow mindless cannibalism to sweep through the country. And he thinks he's doing this great act of sacrifice, but you know, the, almost within the next day, Gingrich is releasing to the press another list of 
uh, ethically problematic people he's going to go after. And it's just a much more cutthroat attitude that translates into their media presence. I am. Um, so we're, we're winding down and I apologize. I keep checking the chats are in different places on my phone. Um, you mentioned your editor and I think this is just sort of, uh, it, this is just me being selfish and asking a question that I would like to know. Um, you are a professor at Princeton. You've written a ton of books. You're a you know, beloved professor. You are good at talking to students. You're good at communicating ideas. Um, you, you know, run your work by colleagues. You have second readers. An editor at a big house, we're at the same house, but an editor at a big house, how much, um, it sounds like she was really invested in it in a way where she was looking around at things all the time, making suggestions. It sounds like she was really engaged. What sort of role does an editor play for you? Is this different? Is this an editor you've worked with a lot? So the, edi the editor I mentioned, Jill, is from USA Today. It was from oh, okay. My editor here was, it ended up being, the one who was, my editor was working at left uh, to do a different job. And so Same, it I always happens. Curricular. But he picked it up. It was already done. So it was interesting. It wasn't in the developmental stage. The book was actually written. But that last round of edits, he was, ve he was superb. Uh, he was deeply invested in the story, was incredibly helpful uh, at finding points in the narrative that we've been discussing that I could really either amplify or, or things I could get rid of that were interesting to me, maybe to him, but not really to most readers. Mm -hmm. And it was a great experience, actually. I mean, I've worked with some very good editors. Um, Scott Moyers I've worked with, who's also at Penguin. And it, I love editors. I'm one of these writers. Some writers are not editor people and they don't like hearing the criticism and they don't like hearing the I love it. And for yeah. this book, it was quite important because it's a different kind of book than I usually write. It's not my standard style. Uh, and the editor, Christopher, was uh, incredibly, incredibly helpful to me. And again, not in the development. Uh, although right. the person I'll add who originally signed the book was Scott Moyers, who edited my Great Society book and he's kind of moved up the ranks. And he, when I had the proposal, made one comment um, about the whole idea that just stuck in my head and I think was important. It was about really capturing the problems with the Democrats and seeing why I was right vulnerable. What was mm -hmm. wrong, and not just making it a kind of good guy, bad guy narrative. And even that comment I thought was so helpful and it stuck with me writing the book. So I, I, I had a great editorial team and when you do, it really, I think, enhances the book uh, in, in many ways. I think it, yeah, it definitely shows. It definitely shows because I think this is the kind of history book um, that's written for, for readers, you know, that's really written to be consumed and to learn, but to enjoy. And I purposely did not touch on the downfall because I think that that is something to really experience um, firsthand to go through it. Um, what's next? What's next is something 100% different. Uh, I'm writing a book, a uh, biography of a rabbi. On George named, Washington. No, no. <laughs> a rabbi named Abraham Joshua Heschel, uh, who was uh, a theologian at the Jewish Theological Seminary. But in the 60s, he became a pretty prominent civil rights activist. He marched mm -hmm. with King in Selma. And then he was very important to the anti-Vietnam movement. He was a founder of these a uh, group of clergy fighting the war. So I'm writing for the Jewish Live series of Yale University Press, a biography about him. I'm pretty deep into it, uh, done with the draft, and very different than Newt Gingrich, uh, more of an inspirational story, but it's, uh, it's, it's been a great experience to get into that as well. A hero, that would be really lovely to write about and spend time. <laughs> so that's next, right? Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us and for giving us so many good books to read and for the ones that um, we expect you to deliver in the future. Uh, thank you to the Brooklyn Historical Society and everyone who joined us tonight. This is um, such an important thing to discuss and uh, to keep this interaction going during this challenging time. I hope that everyone is safe and well and has a good night. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Stay healthy.